Advocacy, and he has been conferred with the title of Doctor Fellow of the Royal Institute of Architects in Singapore in April 2018. Our second speaker is architect Angelo Manyosa, Chief Executive Officer of Manyosa and Company Incorporated, Managing Partner of Manyosa and Architects, Founding Member of the Philippine Green Building Council, 2010 Metrobank Art and Design Excellence for Architecture Competition for Green Homes Awardee, and a member of Australia and New Zealand Chamber of Commerce Green Architecture Movement and United Architects of the Philippines. Our third speaker is interior designer Chat Forest, founding partner of Chat Forest Design Studio, which aims to provide clients with a finished product, a finished project that is timeless, combining aesthetics and function. She was also finalist for PRC's Outstanding Professional of the Year for the years 2017 and 2019, and she is an instructor at the Philippine School of Interior Design. Our fourth and last speaker is architect Giorgio Tolentino, founder, president, and CEO of IDEA Philippines Incorporated. Today, IDEA ranks 45th in the World Architecture Top 100, and it's the 2019 Innovation Company of the Year awarded by Nordcham Philippines. He's one of the top 10 architects uh, by BCI Asia, and he's also a PRC awardee for most outstanding professional of the year in the field of architecture for the year 2017. He is also a recipient of the National Commission for Culture and the Arts Award and an Ernst and Young's Innovation Entrepreneur Award. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, our, our expert speakers have something in common. They are all members of the advisory board of Enderance New College of Architecture and Design with architect Palafox as chairman. We are indeed lucky to have them on board together with our Dean for the College of Architecture, architect Jean Cornejo, and our Dean for the College of Interior Design, Dr. Lil De Jesus. To all our incoming students, congratulations. You will be learning from the best. Architecture and interior design have been around for a very long time. In fact, all the way back to prehistoric times. One may argue that the interior, that interior design is older and was born as soon as the first human families lived in caves, planning their living spaces and decorating the cave walls with art. But others may also argue that architecture is older because in areas without caves, our ancestors had to live up in the trees to avoid the dangers on the ground. Their tree houses would have been made with wood, thus the first architects. As civilizations grew and the first cities took shape, urban planning was born. The point here is that these disciplines are essential to human life, and thus there will always be demand for them. So for the young listeners here today, those who are still thinking of what degree to pursue in college, consider studying these essential disciplines, do your best, and you will surely have a long, sustainable career. Okay, in today's modern world, Urban planning, architecture, and interior design are firmly established, but they continue to evolve with the changing times. How are they evolving as we, prepare, as we prepare ourselves for the future? Allow me to present a brief overview of specific touch points to help set the tone for today's talks. There are four global mega factors or mega trends that impact the present and future of urban planning, architecture, and design. First is rapidly growing urbanization. Second is the climate crisis. Third is the COVID-19 pandemic. And the fourth is digital transformation and technology. And as we see from uh, these slides, uh, right now, buildings account for 40% of greenhouse gas emissions in the world. And it's made of uh, concrete, steel, uh, bricks, mortar, materials that have made marks on the earth. And on this slide, you will see that global building stock will increase, uh, will double in area by 2060. So definitely, uh, next slide, please. Uh, here's a screenshot of a recent article, a newsletter article featuring a previous slide, please. Featuring Neri Oxman, the famous uh, bioarchitect. And the title is, Can We Design Our Way Out of the Climate Crisis? Next slide. So these are just uh, screenshots from recent newsletter articles to show you the conversations that are happening uh, today. 
This one is about uh, how smart city planning could slow future pandemics. Next slide. This article shares eight ways COVID-19 will change architecture. Next slide. This is an article on hotel design and COVID-19 labeled, this is the future of hotel design after coronavirus, according to hospitality architects. Next slide. Interior design and COVID-19. Article is titled, Eight Future Interior Trends for the Homes Driven by the Coronavirus. Next. And lastly, an article titled, How Digital Technology is Transforming Architectural Practice. Thank you for uh, showing those slides, Wina. Uh, these are just uh, initial thoughts that will help set the table for today's uh, webinar. And so, Without further ado, we have a lot of uh, content, in insights coming up from our expert speakers. And let's uh, start, start things off with our first speaker to speak to you about urban planning and architecture transformation to the new world order. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome architect Felino June Palafox Jr. Sir June, the floor is yours. Um, Architect June, you're on mute at the moment. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, President Edward Diggs, uh, the rest of the team, uh, Professor Maki Maceda, and fellow speaker. And I'll start with the macro. After all, urban planning set the stage for the other disciplines to come in architecture, engineering, urban design, interior design, and other disciplines in the built environment. So I just show the, the, the urban planning, the smart city planning that we have introduced from our experience in, in 40 countries to our local projects, like the smart city planning that integrate social, environmental, economic goals and efficient processes in that it's people-centric and it's a resilient and well-connected, self-sufficient, socially inclusive. This is our plan for Clark, a smart city, aerotropolis, airport driven city. You can see the green roof, rainwater harvesting, more lungs of the city, the great space, spaces. Next slide, please. So we have been advocating for this. Uh, the road corridor should be one third for trees and landscaping, one third for people, pedestrians and bicycles, and only one third for vehicles. And because it takes at least 10 trees to recover the oxygen out of the carbon monoxide per car. And, and the, there are 20 kinds of transportation. And the, the most uh, sustainable and people-centric are walking and bicycles, then public transport. Next slide. So those with less in wheels should have more in roads. So these are the 20 kinds of urban transport. Unfortunately, in our part of the world, they don't consider walking and bicycles as uh, the first mode of transportation. So especially during this pandemic with social distancing, we have put forward even pre our previous recommendations to make our cities more walkable, more bikeable, especially appropriate for, uh, for social distancing. And we have been proposing even for several decades ago, uh, pedestrian bridges, bike bridges along our rivers like Pasig River and so on. And, and Metro Manila is example of how not to do it. Next slide, please. So if you compare Metro Manila, so this one is pedestrian first, bicycle, public transit, then the private the cars are the worst kind of uh, uh, urban transport. The transportation planning should be uh, movement of people. How many people per lane per hour? Unfortunately, our car-centric planning uh, borrowed from Los Angeles is automobile-centric. Only 2% of Filipinos are, are, are car owners. 100% of us are pedestrians. Once you leave your car, you are a pedestrian. Next slide, please. Then again, uh, uh, the smart mobility and transportation. You get around with cleaner, safer, and more efficient ways. 
to reduce congestion, promote faster, environment-friendly, affordable transportation options. And urban planning is uh, land use, transportation, uh, transportation housing, uh, utilities, services, and then it's interdisciplinary with other disciplines in the built environment. You know, I've been describing like in Metro Manila, we have OFWs, the workers and employees of Makati Central Business District, Ortigas, and Fort Bonifacio, spend about six hours a day with traffic away from their families. So this pandemic is waking us up. We have been promoting, especially our projects elsewhere in the world, the 20-minute uh, uh, walk, 20-minute uh, bicycle, 20-minute public transport. So ideally, you should be within 20 minutes walking, bicycle, and public transit to, your, to all your destinations. Unfortunately, in our part of the world, we, we segregate uses. Uh, like in Makati, it has the Makati Central Business District, the daytime population is 11 times the nighttime population because it's surrounded by low density gated communities. And the employees of Makati are priced out of the housing stock of Makati. The same in Ortigas and, 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 uh, and Fort Bonifacio. So uh, scholars and students are coming to my office or in Metro Manila to unlearn the mistakes of Metro Manila. In the 70s, the planning of Metro Manila was one of the good examples of metropolitan planning, which I happen to have been the uh, team leader for development planning for the World Bank Fund in Metro Manila. So getting around, let, let's just go fast with the slides so we can have more conversation. So this is a, a Clark, these are roads in Clark. So again, the one third, one third, one third wood, more trees and more walkable uh, uh, environments, built environment. So walking, biking, public transport, private vehicles. So the transport corridor doesn't only include vehicles. Next slide, please. And, uh, and this one is our proposal for EDSA. Uh, walkable, bikeable, all kinds of transport mode. And I proposed this to the Asian Development Bank, I think 10 years ago. Now they will be funding the elevated walkways. Again, EDSA corridor is how not to do it. You have the 13 LRT stations uh, along EDSA, surrounded by gated military camps and gated, uh, uh, gated uh, villages. Elsewhere in the world, we have a transportation a transit station you increase the density so that people can walk to it. And, and EDSA corridor is, needs eight parallel roads. And where are these parallel roads? Inside gated communities and military camps. So again, we propose here a multimodal, elevated, multimodal transportation, flyover, elevated walkways, a subway, and again, the, the, the busways and the pedestrian promenades. Next slide, please. Next slide. Any, anyway, I, I'll just keep talking. So this is our proposal for elevated pedestrian walkway above EDSA because uh, healthy cities encourage more walking. To stay healthy among us adults, we must walk at least seven kilometers a day or 10,000 uh, steps. I can walk 20,000 steps uh, or 14 kilometers elsewhere in the world. And I think most of us, if not all of us have been walking that much even during July, August in New York, in Manhattan, in Hamburg, London, Paris, New York, maybe in Singapore, hot and humid like us, you can, you can still walk seven kilometers Singapore shaded by the trees. So, and also introducing some retail so that when there are more ice in the public realm, better security. Next slide, please. And again, uh, the transportation corridor with linear parks along EDSA. Next slide. So these are Metro Daba. We just completed the uh, Metro Daba Urban Master Plan. Eight, eight cities and municipalities. And again, make use of walking promenades, especially along the Bow Gulf, as uh, take advantage of the waterfront. Elsewhere in the world, waterfront is a front door of development. Unfortunately, in our country, it's a uh, back of the house, Basurahan. Like, Dubai, they ran out of, uh, of coastline, so they created the Palm Islands to have more waterfront development. And we are the third longest coastline in the world, and we're not making use of our waterfronts. Next slide. 
So again, Metro Davao Coastal Road, and most, sometimes even public works, they put the road alongside the waterfront. So there should be prominence along it. Next slide, please. I think we just go fast with it. So I just uh, describe the concept as we, let's have eight seconds per slide. So again, the, the coastal road, which we are implementing in most of the cities with the projects. So this is more of urban design already. Ur again, more walking and so on. Uh, I, I spoke to the Philippine Franchising Association, which composed of retailers and restaurants. Uh, most of our eating places, I, I told them restaurants, 30% for the kitchen, 30% for indoor dining, and 40% outdoor dining. Because natural light and ventilation uh, will be the key, outdoor, outdoor. So these are promenading in, uh, we found in Metro Davao. Even the architectural typology is influenced by, by Mindanao uh, architecture. This is the intermodal transit terminal. Next slide. So again, uh, blending together urban planning, urban design. This is uh, in Pampanga. We put the uh, uh, we put transportation corridors with pedestrian. Uh, this is in Clark. Hopefully, the, the the buildings will be green buildings with rainwater harvesting, green roofs, rooftops, and and so on. And next slide. So again, in Clark, you can see the abundance of promenades, walking, and no walls. In 1998, we had a conference in the American Planning Association. Survey says. Criminals are not scared of walls. You can, you can, uh, you can uh, have uh, commit crime inside the walls. No witnesses. You can program it above the walls. No witnesses. It happened in Marawi, and there is uh, less criminality when, uh, when there are more eyes in the public room. There's less criminals are scared of windows because the, behind the window is a potential witness. So we have to re-educate policymakers on. In fact, we have the best landscaping in our villages. Unfortunately, they are walled off. This is for rehabilitation of San Juan River. And we did a smart city planning for San Juan, which I was invited in Berlin and Songdo in South Korea to present San Juan as a smart city of the future. Next slide, we just go on. Yeah, again, uh, Estero de la Arena in, 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 in Manila. So waterfronts are, again, front door development and so on. We just go on with these slides while uh, I talk about smart cities, healthy cities, livable cities, uh, new urbanism, green transport, green urbanism, walkable, bikeable transport, and, and more open spaces. If you compare Metro Manila to the human body, the lungs of the cities, this is our, I call it postcards of the future, Pasig River. We did our urbanization master plan for Pasig River interconnecting Laguna Lake and Manila Bay with promenades along the way. And on the left side is Makati and uh, fully built Rockwell in the future and Mandalay in the right. I wrote this in my third paper at UP, 1973. Development is not worthy of the name unless spread evenly like butter and a piece of bread. Today they call this inclusionary zoning, inclusive development, again with promenades. Next slide. So all of this and everything we do is for God, country and planet Earth. And I think we all like to live in, in uh, master plan communities. Next slide, please. Uh, we all like to live in master plan, environment friendly, uh, design buildings, communities and cities that are sm smart, resilient, livable, connected, accessible, walkable, bikeable, Safer, better lighted, more convenient, cleaner with mixed income, cross generational neighborhoods with mixed use development that will integrate places to live, work, shop, dine, learn and worship with healthcare and recreation, with leisure and some 24 hour cycle activity centers. Thank you very much. And I hope we'll have more conversation uh, during the open forum. And thank you very much for the opportunity to share. Thank you. Thank Thank you so much, Architect June Palafox, for your insights. May we remind everyone to, you can post your questions and comments here on Zoom or on our streaming at YouTube. And uh, our webinar team will collate and curate all your questions for the open forum later. 
Okay, moving on to our next speaker uh, to speak to us on adapting to a sustainable living and leisure in architecture. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome architect Angelo Agnosa. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Am I coming in clear? Yes. Uh, okay, thank you, thank you. Let me just put up my... Uh, Uh, there do you see the uh, do you see the slide is it coming clear yes clear okay so. um so we were we were asked to kind of give our thoughts on uh on what a a post covid um a world would feel like in architecture and it's kind of hard to encompass everything in in, in 10 minutes but um just to give you some of my thoughts i, I decided to put it in bullet points I'll just discuss quickly um, our thoughts on how we think um, residential um, buildings are going to adapt into a post-COVID world. Uh, just some initial thoughts as well on hospitality. And I'll just very quickly show you a, a project which I think kind of has a good gap between the two. So uh, when we're looking at the, a post-COVID world um, for residential architecture, it's quite simple now. Uh, so one of the things that I was looking at uh, is I think we will go back to traditional uh, type floor plans. Uh, so the open floor plans, which was pretty much celebrated, which combined the living room, the dining room, kitchen, and other parts of the house will change. Uh, open planning will prove to be a hindrance for a home that shares things like office spaces, um, learning spaces for the kids, uh, you know, entertainment spaces, like, like uh, a good example would be uh, dad's home office can't really intermingle with mom's workout space. Uh, and at the same time, uh, makeshift home schools and areas become playrooms. And so the flexibility of using partitions, uh, movable dividers, transformable furniture um, will allow for better flexibility in the design. Uh, foyers and mudrooms, I think, will become one of the new norms. Uh, we never really needed mudrooms in the tropics as we don't really have the problems of snow and wet clothing thawing into our house. But I do foresee that such a room can be used as a disinfectant or sanitation room prior to anybody entering a house. Alternatively, the integration of large foyers complete with cabinets, shoe racking systems, lavatories prior to entering the house can be an acceptable conversion for, for some of our, our residential houses. Um, of course, you've got the work from home. Uh, the rooms should also be better planned for functional work areas, lighting, acoustics, temperature control. The old ways of working where you have a dining room or living room and a laptop will really no longer work. Uh, you know, such type of space can make people more productive working with, with home and, and less distractions if you have proper home offices. And of course, keeping in touch with nature. Uh, the need for atriums, balconies, patios, gardens, or even vertical gardens to, to hang uh, pots and, and vertical wall gardens would be integral in having to commune with nature. Uh, as more people stay at home, many have shifted to gardening. And I believe that there will be a growing trend of uh, garden spaces that will be necessary, no matter how small, um, within a home. Uh, we also have the exercise room with uh, more restrictions and fitness centers. People will be spending more time at home. And where does one exercise when your partner is having a conference call from the office? So I believe that uh, home gyms and workout areas will be just as important as, uh, as a home office. And uh, of course, finally, we say less is more. Uh, so during the ECQ lockdown, we started learning that we could actually survive with a lot less, uh, a lot less luxuries and things. I think people have, uh, as I think as people spend more time at home, they will begin to shed a lot more things that they don't need. Uh, space will be at a premium. So those old golf clubs that you've had in the shower closet uh, or, or in your garage will definitely be repurposed and, and be, be thrown out as more space will be required within the house. Now, jumping to the hospitality sector, uh, quite simply, I believe that 
economy type hotels will have a, a faster return than the luxury type hotels. Um, that's in part because economy hotels are better able to tap segments of demand that remain relatively healthy despite travel restrictions. So, so they still have um, access to things like uh, businessmen, you know, seamen, long staying backpackers, truck drivers, transient healthcare workers, frontliners, uh, even tourists who come to the country and have to be quarantined for 14 days before entering. Um, that's where economy type hotels will be, will be able to, to, to gain uh, better ground. All hotels do have their fixed costs, but economy hotels will have more resilience as they have the ability to use things like family labor or to mitigate some of their variable and semi-variable um, fixed costs. So smaller scale properties also make more suitable um, for managing semi-fixed um, semi costs. And of course, smaller economy hotels tend to have less rooms, so less guests, which is a very positive in a post-COVID world. Uh, for travel habits, I believe hospitality segment that rely on conferences and industries uh, or industry events like, like MICE centers, uh, you know, MICE um, meetings, incentives, conference and exhibitions, uh, they will likely be the last to return. Uh, and again, that's a personal view. Um, in leisure, we already see that traveling to, to visit friends and relatives have started to return first, uh, which means they, they pretty much travel by car. Uh, travel restrictions combined with economic uncertainty will likely translate into higher shares of domestic and close to home travel. Uh, visiting other parts of the country or going to second homes will dominate the landscape, while longer international leisure trips will be slow to return. And travelers, I think, will expect greater flexibility when it comes to flight cancellations, hotel cancellations, or, or, change, change, or change order fees. Of course, the key for economy type hotels will be for them to give travelers the security of sanitation and hygiene in all levels of the property. And this is, I think, where the, the niche comes for small luxury type hotels. Um, and and that, that's a special place for them because they will offer exclusivity being small number of rooms, you know, island setting type of places, uh, they will have be they'll have the capability of showing hygiene in all levels. Uh, of course, small luxury hotels always have a great F and B, and being a small property, it's always easy for them to manage their fixed costs and and flexibility on on their price points. But above all, they still um, give the luxury um, experience, which is very critical, right? So. Uh, I'll show you a quick project of how those two um, thought processes kind of intermingle. This project in no way was designed with a pandemic in mind. It just kind of forest gumped its way into, into being able to adapt to the situation, which I thought would be a good, a good uh, project to show. So the project sits uh, in, in, in Australia, Southwestern Australia a place called the Oaks. Uh, it's 125 hectare property. So it's got a lot of sprawling space. Um, the mornings are absolutely beautiful. You've got the, the sun kissing the, uh, the landscape and then you, you develop this, this sort of mist. Um, and it's just an absolutely magical place to be in. Uh, it is primarily a, a thoroughbred um, stud farm and uh, people send their, their horses here for training, for conditioning and for rest and recreation. Uh, it's both for the, uh, for the homeowners, uh, horse owners and the horses um, uh, rest and recreation. Of course, you have uh, other critters that uh, dominate the landscape, but the property itself is broken down into three areas, which makes it a very post COVID, post pandemic um, uh, friendly location because uh, you have the, the farm stay, the homestead, and you have the stable section. So the farm stays what we developed. The homestead is currently under renovation and it's currently what we are converting into our pre-entry to, to, the, to the farm stay. And uh, it's where people get checked. Uh, this is like the mudroom, but of course a, a larger, more glorified mudroom. Then you go into the farm stay and this is the farm stay. And the farm stay happens to be divided into pavilion type settings. So uh, we, 
designed the rooms to be individualized and we embedded them into the hill. Uh, and so we use earth mass um, to be able to uh, keep the rooms heated and cooled. Uh, then you have the living pavilion, the games pavilion, and master's pavilion, um, the gym, which are again all separated in, in different types of, uh, of pavilion settings. So this is the dream when we were imagining it, and this is the reality of, of, of what the structure looks like. Um, it actually uh, uh, has a, a, a green star rating, a five star green star rating. We looked at the energy, glazing, um, indoor air quality, uh, things like thermal mass, uh, water, uh, recyclability, uh, the whole nine yards. But we also wanted to bring in a touch of Pinoy into our, our structure. So we brought in our, our local abaca, our local bamboo, um, mixed, uh, and even coconut, coconut inlays, mixed with um, Australian culture and, and what was locally Australian. Uh, so materials that were cho uh, chosen, um, the sandstone you see there, the spotted gum wood, um, again, these were all local materials, try and begin to localize um, the flavor as well. Uh, natural lighting, daylighting was critical um, for the structures. Even the, uh, the, the uh, closet areas, you get natural daylight um, coming in through solar tubes. Of course, the, the living pavilion um, was still a integrated uh, living dining um, type of pavilion. But again, we brought in a lot of our local flavor. Um, we kept our, our, uh, our carbon footprint low uh, on, during the count. And this is during sunset and during the day, you can see natural daylight coming in and you really don't need to, to turn on any, any electricity. Uh, and this is what the, the dining uh, table, uh, dining area looks like, which opens up into the, the living space. Um, we have a game room, again, segmental, uh, segmented, uh, which we wanted to bring in a local Australian flavor. So we looked at Australian art, um, didgeridoo. Uh, we brought in our local, um, Pinoy bamboo fabrics, we brought in our coconut inlays and uh, some few luxuries like a, a glass billiard table, um, which the client wanted, um, full karaoke system and, and, and the works. No? Uh, of course, the heart of the, the structure is the kitchen. Uh, kitchen was done uh, with transformable tables. So, this, uh, so the table you see there transforms into a table that can sit up to 18 people. Um, there is a full working uh, support kitchen underneath, uh, fully fully functional with uh, with high pressured wok burners um, for Asian cooking as well, uh, which is part of the requirement. And uh, you know the structure uh, we looked at local um, uh, local landscape, local uh, flora and fauna, and we also looked at how uh, the uh, the landscape that we introduced would actually affect the, the existing wildlife uh, within the structure. When it comes to sunset, um, you know, the place really turns magical. It's, a, it's an absolutely wonderful site. The fire pit gets going and from, from the fire area, you can, from the fire pit, you can actually see the, the Sydney skyline um, as it goes into, into, into its sunset. Um, and of course we wanted a, an entrance, which is very uniquely, uh, a Manosa, a, uh, a Manosa signature, and we wanted that to be a, a focal point of something that we could uh, um, leave our thumbprint um, on this structure, right? So if I can, if I can just uh, quickly conclude, uh, I'll just read this conclusion statement, then I'll show you quickly a video right after of, of what this structure looks like. So architect Louis Sullivan once said that form follows function, and my late father Francisco Bobby Manosa would jokingly say that architecture has been led astray so much to the point where form follows fashion. When many architects turned inward into theoretical discourse that grew increasingly detached from practicality in design, there is now a feeling that architecture needs to be both theoretical and pragmatic at the same time. Our lockdown isolation from life, social knowledge and discourse I believe has truly harmed us all Everyone on the planet has gotten affected by it. There is no one master architectural solution to moving forward after a pandemic. If I can quote architect Elizabeth Diller, who once said that this is a problem that is going to be solved by medicine and it's not going to be cured by architecture. 
So I believe post-pandemic architecture carries a social problem, an economic problem, and a moral problem. You can't find a solution without the help of your, all the other friends in the industry. And that's from government to private sector to the academe down the line. Moving forward, we really must look deep into ourselves and create architecture that is sustainable, local, flexible, adaptive, responsive, has accountability, and carries moral ethics rather than architecture that is based on one's ego. And hopefully we will really embrace the true meaning of what form follows function means. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Architect Jello, for the amazing images, amazing insights. Okay, uh, uh, to our attendees, as you can see, uh, our questions are starting to pile up. Uh, there's a button on the bottom of your screen, Q&A button, so you can post your questions there. And our webinar team is, at the moment, uh, curating all those questions for the open forum. All right, our third speaker, to speak to us about design ideas for new spaces and homes is interior designer Chad Forrest. Chad, you have the room. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. When in line with the movement of architecture, um, interior design has to move forward as well. And with the current situation that we're in, um, we've noticed that, well, we're spending about 100% of our lives in our homes. And this is where we now work. This is where we play and this is where we sleep. So with this in mind, we have to adapt and we have to adjust and we have to make our spaces more functional, more efficient without having to sacrifice the main purpose of our house, which is for us to relax and for us to bond with our family. So we have to put all these functions together. Now, if we have the benefit of space and you have a big home, by all means, you can create your own study, your own function room, your own theater room, your own bedroom, your own library. But then if you don't have this, when you just have a space, there are many things you have to consider now, such as rearranging your layouts and fixing your furniture space. Another thing is getting rid of your all your clutter and unnecessary things. But there are items or collectible pieces that clients do not want to get rid of. So how do we do that? Now, one thing that we can do is we can start using furniture that can adapt to changes as well. So that's what you call transformer type furniture as what architect Angelo was saying, and we call them smart furniture. So I'll be showing you pieces that we have used and pieces that we, we plan to use for our homes. Um, next, next slide, please. Next slide. Yeah. So this is a bunk bed, but this is not a typical bunk bed. And you have to make it a bit more functional. And you can watch TV, you can study, you can sleep on top, and you can actually do everything within the space. So this is what you call transformer type furniture. The picture on the left shows a bed that transforms into a desk. And you know you can create a platform. In this case, a platform was created for exercise. So you have your own little gym per se. Next slide, please. Next. All right, now you can actually convert some of your spaces into, oh, can we get back to the other slide, please? Rewind. All right, now we can have a, a treadmill or an exercise machine that we can tuck into our cabinets. That's one way of keeping the clutter out. 
Next slide, please. Okay, or we can have a sofa that actually converts into a, an actual full-size bed. You know, gone are the days that you have like a sofa bed that converts into a little bed. No, let's, let's deal with something more comfortable. We have a full-size bed or a queen-size bed convertible. So it doesn't mean just because you have smart furniture doesn't mean that you have to adapt to a very functional looking utilitarian space. No, you can have something very contemporary, very modern or transitional. You know, you can have anything. Next. All right, here we have another queen size bed. And you notice that we never change the, the scale or the proportion of the furniture pieces. You know, one thing wrong with having small spaces is that people tend to sacrifice the size of their furniture. You don't have to. What you can do is keep that size of furniture, but take away those that you don't need. So you still have the right proportion and scale in a room. Next. Next, please. All right, here you have a little bit something more, uh, you have something more luxurious. You have a sofa bed that converts into a, a queen size and you have your shelving. So it's practically a room within a room. Next. All right, this is another picture. Next, please. All right, this is another view of the bunk bed. And this is a table that you can convert from a side table to a table for four and to a table for eight. Okay, these are extendable tables that are very, very popular. And one thing also that you have to consider when you buy transformer furniture is that these tables have to be very easy to use. Now, this is a console table that you can slide out and it becomes the desk or it can become a dining table for four. Or you can have a table tucked into the sofa, similar to the airplane chairs that you can swing out the tray and you have a tray in. Nowadays, younger people can work anywhere. I noticed that they can work on a sofa, they can work on a kitchen counter. I mean, they can work anywhere, even the balcony. So these pieces of furniture are very adaptable. Next, please. All right, this one, you, you, I wanted to show the size of the sofa that you really don't have to scale it down. You just keep the right pieces of furniture in a space and it'll all work out and it won't look small. Just avoid the clutter and it'll look very, very clean. Next. All right, this is a, a plain wall with a desk that becomes a double bunk bed. So again, you know, it's, it's quite useful and you don't see any traces of, cab, of, of beds or blankets during the day because you're seriously working, but at night it converts into that. Next, please. All right, this again, you have a workspace during the day, which is the picture on the left, but you don't see, you know, usage of space too much. And at night you have a bedroom and you're still using the same space. So you're not wasting any space at all. Next. Next, please. Next. All right, this is a desk that you can pull out. Oh, this is a TV stand, which you can slide and out comes a single bed. This, this I've used this system and it's very, very practical because you can use it for a very small space. So you can put it against a wall and you can have it as an extra guest wall. Instead of a guest room, you can call it a guest wall. Next. Okay, here you have a, a very plain wall that converts into a double bunk bed. All these pieces are very useful for, for condo units or smaller spaces. Some people even use it for an extra room in their home as a guest room. So you can convert like a guest room with a lounge into something of a bedroom. So it depends on the usage. Next, please. All right, this one, you have a movable wall. You have a wall that conceals the kitchen. 
and then you move it out and then you create another space so you can separate your your bedroom from the kitchen i particularly like this one because you can adapt it anywhere next please All right, this is another bed that becomes, you know, a shelf again. Next, please. All right, I love this one because people have a lot of mezzanines and they have their second floors, you know, extra spaces. And when you have nothing to do with those spaces, you can actually have a sofa and you can have a study, which is the picture below, which is typical of some houses. And that's where the kids study. And you can convert it at night, it becomes two bedrooms, uh, two beds, and you actually can convert that space into a bedroom. So it's, it's pretty useful when you have guests in the house as well. Next, please. All right, this one, you can make your own transformer type furniture. The picture on the left shows a futon and that extra platform hydraulically can be lifted to create a dining space or a desk. The one on the right is a movable wall. When you open it, your whole wardrobe system is inside. This one I particularly like because he created a whole system where you have, oh, next please, sorry, next. Okay, you have a system where there are four corners that you can use. Um, you have the sofa and then you have a desk, the bed is on top and a, there's a surprise in the next slide. Next please. Okay, you can put your bike storage. And nowadays people have been biking more and exercising and you can actually put your bike within part of the system. Next, please. Okay, this is a project we did about nine years ago for a showroom where um, it's a, actually a studio unit. And we didn't, you know, every time you enter a studio unit, you always see the kitchen, right? So that's one thing that we wanted to hide. Uh, we wanted to conceal the cooktop, the oven, the range hood, and not see it from the living space. And we had a wall that could move and open, which was also partly storage space. And we had a dining table for four. And when you pull that down, you have a king's queen size bed. So this was our first foray into transformer type furniture and it was very well received. This one is a very basic type where you have a TV that can pivot. It pivots to the bedroom when you're there and it can pivot to the living room. So this one is a, a more basic use of a TV set. Next, please. All right, this one is a 55 square meter loft. And we built the second story structure. And one thing I wanted to show this was, yeah, we use transformer type furniture pieces for this. And it's our way of showing that you don't always have to be so utilitarian looking. You can have, you can have more classic pieces. You can input your artwork and you can use more luxurious finishes such as in this case, we use metallic abaca. We had black mirrors. We had ebony makassar for veneer. We had some copper finishes. And we incorporated the collection, the artwork. And we fit everything in this 55 square meter space. And although this wasn't really a typical residential, you know, for the client, but it was really just like a halfway house. But we wanted to show that small spaces don't have to look so boring. Next, please. Yeah, we incorporated the same kitchen system and this is how it looks when it's open. So I basically don't like seeing cooktops and, you know, the ovens, you know, I don't like seeing them from the living room. So I always like them concealed. So this is how we did it. Next, please. All right, here we also have transport former pieces. This one is a leather piece, which is actually a chest that you can open and you can use your books, hide them inside and use them as a study. So when it's not in use, you can fold it back and it becomes like a chest. So just to show that you can use leather, you can use wood carvings, you can use all these pieces and mix them together. So there are many ways to skin a cat. And, you know, doing smart furniture doesn't mean that you have to just 
use very utilitarian pieces, but you can add a lot of more, a lot of glitz and glamour into your homes. So thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, uh, Interior Designer Chad Forrest, for these wonderful images and ideas. Thank you. And last but not the least, our fourth speaker for today to speak to you on technology in design. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome architect Abelardo Jojo Tolentino Jr. Sir Jojo. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Maceda. Uh, let me uh, share my screen. Hold on. Okay. Uh, do you see my screen now? Not yet, sir. Not yet? Excuse me. Hold on. Uh, we'll try it again. Huh? All right. There you go. It's on. Sir. There you go. Yes. Okay. Thank you, everyone. And uh, it's my pleasure to be here. Uh, as what uh, Professor Maceda said, uh, one of the four future uh, trends in uh, the practice of design is digital transformation. And it has become, so become more apparent uh, uh, during the uh, phases of the lockdown of the COVID uh, era, where we cannot meet face to face. And uh, the kind of communication that we now can do is just through digital form. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the design industry were are one of the late adapters of digital transformation. The technology has been available for several years now, but uh, uh, it's only recently that uh, many of uh, our industry has picked up on this technology. Now, our firm, uh, IDEA, has always seen the importance of merging design and technology. In the past, uh, it, the design uh, and technology integration happened just in uh, putting together the different design disciplines. Uh, now it has become apparent that even the way we communicate and collaborate has to be digitally, digitally transformed. And uh, one of the uh, growing trends uh, in design is what we call virtual design and construction or BDC. If you've heard of building information modeling, BIM, uh, some of the uh, uh, more uh, uh, popular softwares are Revit and Archicad, those fall under this uh, concept of virtual design and construction. And what it really is, is that it, it departs from the old way of doing things where uh, in the past where we're doing AutoCAD, we do things in uh, 2D and therefore our process is very 2D based. Now we work on models or everything is in 3D. So we virtually prototype everything that we do. And we use that prototype for us to get data, to analyze, to uh, improve the design and ultimately to document and use it for downstream work. The idea of uh, virtual design and construction is number one, it should be an end-to-end -end process that not only includes uh, the design part, but in course includes the other downstream work of a building project or even an interior design project where you plan, you design, and then you use it for building the same information in the same model. And also you populate that model, put information so that you can operate the building uh, and use data so that you run the building more efficiently. And in some cases, also use that data for you to demolish and uh, redevelop that whole project and it goes through the same cycle. The other concept of uh, virtual design and construction is that the data or the model that we produce should only be the only source of information or what they say the single source of truth. And the single source of truth is transparent to all the stakeholders of the project at the different design phases uh, and it applies to all aspects of the uh, workflow being designed. When we talk about design, we talk about uh, from the early programming phase concept to the analysis phase, visualization, uh, up to the time that you create the construction documents and execute the work uh, on site. Uh, it, also, it also involves integration 
where we merge on one file, on one prototype, all the different components and different design elements of the project, put information so that we can extract and process data. It also has a lot to do with collaboration, where collaboration happens digitally. Uh, now, uh, collaboration happens using cloud-based solutions, where every member of the project team and every stakeholder looks as just looks looks at look at just one model and one source of information. Later on, uh, another a more high uh, more advanced application of uh, BDC is uh, automating processes. Things that are repetitive uh, can be automated, and in some cases, we can customize workflow so that we can work more efficiently. So what are the applications of BDC? I'll just cite something that uh, things that are very uh, are are more popular and are more mainstream. Uh, if you look at the upper side in design programming, in the past uh, this is done in a manual process. BDC can start in the early programming stage where we gather data, uh, in, uh, input that data in a computer software that shows adjacencies areas summaries, analysis, and once this data and this uh, adjacency is approved, it converts into 3D volumes that you can now use for energy analysis or different massing models. BDC also can automate code checking and code validation uh, such that we can input data, we can use programs and rule sets so that each and every project will run through that rule set and it will create uh, and a report automatically that reports compliance or non-compliance with code with design requirements. Uh, as you go through the uh, more mainstream design work, uh, all the workflow will be 3D based as what you see in the lower right side, where uh, as we develop the design, uh, we don't work on 2D, but see everything in three dimension, analyze and populate the model. Uh, BDC also has a lot to do with uh, using the same model for visualization and prototyping. Uh, you can see here there's three types of applications where you can use that, uh, the model uh, in 3D prototyping. Uh, 3D printing is now becoming popular and the model that you create in design could be the same model that you can use as you prototype uh, the work or the project. And uh, the other on the lower side is the same model is what you use for visualization. Uh, and uh, in this case, uh, an animation. Now, as you go to the deep, more, uh, deeper uh, phases of the design, uh, as I mentioned earlier about integration of not only architecture, but the different uh, elements of the building. As you can see here, uh, engineering and specialty work could be incorporated in one single model. So you can see here on the upper left side where even the structural modeling where you put three bars uh, can be simulated and you can draw data out of that. With this particular project we did, uh, after designing and modeling the structural elements, we had the ability to quantify and even uh, identify the number of steel bars per diameter that we, can, we have to use for the project. Uh, then on the up, on the uh, across that uh, the structural model, MAP modeling also is uh, important because this is something that interfaces with both architectural interiors. Uh, what you see here is a simulation of the design, similar to how you would see it in execution. Uh, one of the biggest aspects of BDC is the ability for the simulation to identify clashes. Uh, in the Philippines, uh, the data that we got is that about 20% of uh, a building's cost is wasted on rework. And it's because of poor uh, design coordination. With BDC and with the uh, 3D uh, technology, you can uh, identify clashes automatically as you write the rule sets so that uh, you can resolve uh, these clashes uh, while it is still on paper, on a digital form, correct it so that it, uh, when you do go to the documentation stage, you will see uh, you can create uh, documents for execution on site 
that are uh, close to class being class free, which translates to a lot of uh, savings. Uh, the VDC also, uh, look again, going downstream in the design process, can help construction managers and project managers uh, do construction simulation, uh, which is what we call the first dimension of the project. And uh, the fifth dimension, which is cost, also can be drawn out of the same model. Uh, cost is an important element, or import is an important uh, given or parameter of any project. And normally cost is something that is only identified at the back end of the work. Uh, in the new uh, BDC process, cost information is drawn as we do the design, which makes us, uh, which gives us a more informed, uh, allows us to, to have more information and therefore allows us to do a, a more appropriate design work. Now, another uh, trend in uh, BDC is what we call digital twinning. Uh, this is uh, the, uh, the, the process of which we transform real buildings into digital form or uh, buildings that are unbuilt, uh, transformed into something that is representative of what it will be when it's completed. Uh, digital twinning has become very important because number one, it allows us to record uh, existing buildings so that there's a reference when we do renovation or when we uh, maintain the building. Also, it allows us to simulate uh, design or new things that we have, that we apply in the building. For example, if we are to uh, install a new AC system in an old building, instead of just uh, installing it before analyzing, the digital twin will allow us to simulate what will happen to real life and debug the system, improve the design before it goes to execution. Uh, this will become a big trend uh, in the near future because uh, all projects will be required to have digital twins and the, the, the era of paper files will be gone. Everything will now be digital. Uh, when we talk about integration, uh, this one, uh, procurement, which is the sixth dimension of a project, is also important. Uh, the, the data that we uh, input in the BIM model or the BDC model can also be a source of procurement, where uh, if, you, if you're an owner who wants to procure or to order or to un understand the quantities of your particular project, or a contractor who would like to order uh, materials for a particular project, then this, this technology will allow us to do that. And lastly, uh, a building will, uh, will operate for at least 40 years. And so the most underexplored uh, area of the building is how you manage uh, it, uh, how you manage it when it's already in operation. And that is all, this is also the phase of a building's life cycle, life cycle that, that, that spends a lot of money. If we have a very inefficient system, or if we do not operate the, the building efficiently, it translates to a lot of cost savings, uh, of, of wastage cost, wasting costs. So facilities management uh, could also be linked to VDC, such that you can, uh, you have an intelligence system that will automate uh, number one, your asset management. Second, your, your, the way you manage, you maintain the, the building. And third, uh, it allows uh, us to gather data and intelligence so that we can make adjustments in the way we run our facilities. Now, talk about collaboration. Uh, virtual uh, design and construction, since it's digital, allows us to share and collaborate virtually in real time. And some of the ways to collaborate is to virtual reality, where uh, uh, you know, a model is beamed on one-to-one -one scale viewed in VR and uh, shared with uh, participants from uh, using different devices anywhere in the world. It could also be through mobile collaboration where we can share information through your mobile device, such as the iPad and uh, your mobile phones. And uh, all of that, can be done through what we call the cloud collaboration technology, where either you host your servers, 
privately or you use private uh, cloud-based servers so that all participants or all stakeholders of the, of the project can log in and can view and comment on the project. Talking about automation, this is a very exciting uh, 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 frontier in design where architects and designers uh, are now going to be required to, uh, to know how to code computers so that we can automate processes and uh, help us design better projects in a more efficient way. Uh, one of the things we, for example, created in the office is automating our construction documentation process from a detailed BIM model, which cuts our production time to more than half. And that translates to more higher productivity and more accurate quality of work. Uh, the other thing about uh, the future of uh, design is data, the use of data. Uh, the customization and programming that we, and automation that I talked about earlier, but, uh, uh, has a lot to do with data. Uh, the other use of data is to, to use it uh, as a driver for design. Uh, what are the things that we see uh, in the future that makes use of data? Another exciting frontier in design is what we call generative design. And this is use coding, using coding and writing design parameters so that the computer helps us to create a, a start, uh, explore different design uh, options, which, uh, you know, through certain parameters, we can uh, shortlist and we can find the best and optimized approach to a particular design problem. Uh, also, uh, using more immersive ways of explaining design is one of the future trends of uh, our industry. Uh, our industry now is migrating to game uh, technology where we're using game, uh, game platforms for us to visualize and to present information. Uh, using coding, again, uh, in this case, visual programming. And in the future, uh, we will use a lot of data uh, using bl blockchain technology for us to apply in our projects, IoT, robotics, machine learning, big data, and using artificial intelligence for us to aid us in our design. The goal of technology is for us to lessen the work that is repetitive and also to uh, enable us to, to, uh, to, to use data and to use processes that are automated so that we can spend more time creating in the creativity and strategic design work. Okay, my last slide is this. Uh, now, how do we see the, the industry or the, the, uh, the industry of design in the future. At present, the way we see designers, the traditional way of seeing designers is that we are technical experts, we're contractors, and we are project managers. As, but in the future, we see design not only as this, uh, designers, as, as not only professionals being experts in design. To us, the, being a good designer will be, is only the entry point of being a good designer. Uh, but we also should be integrators, strategists, design thinkers. Our scope will become bigger. We are creativity consultants, technology providers. We, are, we use data a lot. We know how to program or we have an understanding in programming and find a way for us to use programming and data uh, in, our press, in, a, in our design work. We are makers and in the end, we are educators. So that's my short... Uh, presentation on technology and design, and thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you so much, architect Giorgio Tolentino. And uh, it may seem daunting with all these high-tech technologies you're using, but we take solace in the fact that today's students are digital natives. Yep. All right. So we will dispense with the closing statements and jump right into the Q&A and reserve the closing statements for the end of the webinar. Uh, we have more than 100 questions, and unfortunately, we won't be able to go through each and every one of them. But let me first pose a question to our first speaker, Architect Palafox. This uh, question on YouTube. I noticed a lot of infrastructure in Metro Manila has failed due to poor planning. 
how do we go about finally implementing the proposed urban plans like the Estero rehabilitations and EDSA elevated walkways, etc. And a related question from Mr. Aldrin Agbayani, who will fund these rehab projects? Sir June? Yeah, thank you. Good question. <clears throat> it's not lack of urban planning, lack of implementation. Like I mentioned about Metro Plan 1976, we said that time with a do nothing scenario, we'll have catastrophic traffic, flooding, not prepared for disasters, garbage, and all We said that 1976, before I started working in Dubai and elsewhere in the world, because there's lack of continuity and, and all successful cities in the world, they have visionary leaders, leadership, uh, strong political will, good appreciation of urban planning, good appreciation of design, like architecture and engineering, and good governance, and lack of community, uh, continuity. The other one, if you do a good plan, the plans we do, we also do a business plan. So once you do the plan, it's easier to get funding. Like the elevated walkways on EDSA, it's going to be funded by Asian Development Bank, finally. The circumferential road number six being implemented now was planned in 1945. The light rail transit should have completed eight lines by 1992. So it's not lack of planning, it's lack of uh, continuity and, 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 uh, and uh, continuity and uh, uh, what they call institutional memory. Yeah. We, we have the best plan, even architecture, we have the best arch Most architectural offices in the world, back rooms are Filipino architects. And 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 uh, we we have uh, we, we have it we have, we have those plans but there should really be like the smart cities the smart technology is supposed to look at the smart cities smart governance the smart people the smart transportation and so on and once we have that digital infrastructure that architect Jojo done it in a macro scale we could even work work from home in Zamboanga for a job in Makati. And I, I've written after I guest lecture in Harvard and MIT, Soho, a small office, home office. And that's the working from home right now. I wrote that 1998. And we're always behind unless our uh, Asian neighbors, they, they implement quickly. I hope I answered that question. Thank you so much, uh, Sir Jun. Uh, let's field the question now to architect Jello from an anonymous attendee. Factories and other mass gathering will eventually open. Thoughts on how can people who need to work as a group be able to adjust post COVID and what can business owners do architecture wise to deal with this nature of businesses? Sir Jello. Uh, Jello. There, sorry, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Um, again, in a post-COVID world, um, architecture can only really do so much uh, outside of what we're already being told of doing social dis distancing, uh, keeping our uh, keeping our wash our hands clean. Um, we really don't have uh, proper viable solutions outside of many that have already been been brought up now. Um, you asked me what's the solution. Personally, I, I really think it's not a, an architectural solution, but, but a, a medicine solution as well that, that will end up um, fixing some of these issues. But definitely uh, moving forward, there is that, that social moral um, responsibility that, that, that we all have to kind of look and begin to integrate. And we as architects uh, really have to start changing the way we we design and definitely the word space, which is always a problem um, when we talk about different types of projects. Um, space really is, is at a premium and that's in a post pandemic world, what, what we all actually need. So it would pretty much be the same. I mean, do your social distancing. You'd have to, you'd have to uh, uh, start putting schedules for your people moving in and out. Um, large room spaces would have to be segregated. Uh, if you can't segregate your people, you'll have to segregate your buildings. Um, but moving forward, ideally, 
you'd have that that ability to 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 to, to do those those kinds of uh, transformations as opposed to um, doing the business as usual. Thank you, Sir Jello. Uh, our next question is for interior designer Chad Forrest from K. Patricia Picasso, who is from UP Design Corps, an interior design academic or from UP. And her question is, how will lower to middle class Filipinos be able to adapt and apply the use of transformer type furniture in the middle of the pandemic? in consideration of the cost of the furniture and how rearranging one's home layout is not the priority of most people struggling to earn money to feed their families. Ms. Chat? Is this lower mid, mid and? Yes, yeah, lower to middle how, class Filipinas. How will they move into transformer? Yes, how, how will they be able well, if, to adapt simple. and apply? If they're not thinking about it, yeah, if they're not thinking about it, why do it, right? But I'm applying to people who want to fix it. So okay. for those who cannot afford the higher end pieces, because I know they're kind of expensive, they're the cost of a car, but for those who cannot afford, you can always be more ingenious. That's why we showed pieces that you can adapt, such as creating platforms in a small space where you can have like a banquette seat against the window or against the wall that you can lift up and it can have storage underneath. You can have the more basic transformer type pieces. And you can actually build in stuff into your systems, like your desk. Your desk and your shelving can be built in to a system. And of course, you know, the, the, the price that's expensive in transformer pieces is the hardware. And it's hard to recommend pieces that are not reliable because they tend to not work properly and can actually cause bigger accidents. So I would say if for the lower end market and if you're trying to create a transformer type piece, it would be better to, to do your own thing. Like the one I showed with a bike storage, that's something that the guy made from scratch and he had a storage, he created the system where you have four corners one for storage, one as a desk, one for a living space, and the top is for a bedroom. So, you know, this is a matter of creativity. It's not how much money you have. It's more like how creative you can be. And this actually adapts to the user of the space. What does he actually do? Does he work from the house? Does he have a lot of clothes? Does he have like a lot of cooking materials? You know, it really depends on the usage. So it, you just have to be more creative and more ingenious in thinking of ways to transform pieces. Because, you know, when they asked me to do a layout for a showroom using these pieces and incorporating our own designs, you know that we had to show like eight options and we had to stop because we were going on and on and on and creating more pieces. And I said, this has to stop because the client will have no, you know, he wouldn't be able to choose anything anymore because it's too much. And believe me, there are many ways to do it. And it's just so exciting, but you know, you have to stop yourself. So being a student and creating these transformer type pieces, it's, it's really fun to do. And you start off with a layout, you start off with a floor plan and that's how you can do it. And then start off with that and move on to the elevations. And that's how you can be more inventive. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Chat. And a question for architect Jojo. Are these VDC technologies currently being practiced in IDEA? And if so, is it difficult for other architectural firms, big or small, to incorporate this kind of technology? And a related question, what challenges do you see Philippine firms encountering when making the full shift to VDC? Sir Jojo? Uh, Sir Jojo, your mic is muted. Pa. Sorry. Uh I was saying uh, most of what I showed, uh, except for the facilities management uh, uh, application is already implemented in IDEA's workflow. Uh, we also invested in a software group. Uh, we organized uh, a software division in the office. These are non-architects who we thought to think like architects so that they can write codes and software that we use uh, for our own projects. So we, we, we use that. We've been uh, in BDC for the last 15 years, uh, and it's difficult. Uh, it is number one, uh, there's a cost a price tag to it, uh, changing software, uh, 
changing hardware. Uh, but the most important, the, the biggest challenge we, we, uh, we saw in migrating from 2D to 3D technology is the mindset. Because it's difficult for people to change, especially if they are experts. Uh, where we had difficulties with our AutoCAD experts migrating to 3D. Uh, some of them had to leave the company because they were not willing to adapt. Uh, for smaller firms, I, uh, the, the transition should be easier because uh, you're, you're not going to involve a, a lot of people. When we migrated to, to, uh, to BDC, we had about 70 people and uh, we were working on uh, I, I would say 50 live projects. So that was difficult. Uh, so I would recommend for smaller firms to start migrating to this technology because this could be the equalizer uh, that you're looking for. And you, you don't uh, need a lot of people to produce, uh, to, to handle more projects and to produce good design. And, to, and also to be able to do projects outside of the country. Thank you, Sir Giorgio. Um... To all our participants, uh, all your questions will be emailed and sent to our speakers. Uh, to our speakers, uh, you'd also be uh, happy to note that there are a lot of messages on the Q&A portion in the box saying that you've inspired them. Thank you for inspiring them. So at this point, let's uh, finalize our webinar with uh, some closing statements from each of our speakers. Your overall thoughts on uh, the webinar today uh, let's start with architect June Palafox. Yeah. Thank you for the conversation. Thank you for the, taking the time to have a conversation with us. And you can see in here, lessons take away. So architecture, design, and urban planning is the art and science of placemaking. It's, a, it's connectivity, convergence, collaboration, integration, interdisciplinary, Multidisciplinary. It's not in silos. So we all intersect in the, in, the, in the built environment and putting together to a bit form, space, time, form, function, art, science, uh, uh, technology, culture, history, and so on. And our overarching guidelines in, in our office is people first or social activity, then planet Earth or the environment. Then we can talk about prosperity and profit, economic growth, and culture, history, and heritage, and interfaith architecture. And we just don't do architecture for those who, who write the paycheck for our professional fees. We think of the end user. We think of the beneficiaries if we do a good job. We think of the sufferers if we do a good job. And, and one of my professors in Harvard used to tell us, this century will be a rare century. We imagine, we design, we engineer, we architecture, and hopefully we'll have urban renaissance. And, and we, we, we design and plan, not for our, our generation, but future generations as well. And, and there's no playbook, uh, they say, for this pandemic or post-pandemic, but we can look back uh, uh, Hippocrates, uh, 400 BC, the, uh, of medicine and science, he said the physical environment will have a direct effect on, uh, on the spread of disease like epidemics. And then Florence Nightingale, the nurse, he said every hospital must have direct sunlight and cross ventilation. And we look at our some of our hospitals here, some some rooms or even ICU, they don't have, they don't have sunlight and, and so on. And then in the 1600, 1800, there was an epidemic in London. So what did they fix? The sewage system, sanitation, water, and so on. And in, in the US, Frederick Law Olmsted, he created more than 100 parks and open spaces. Those parks and open spaces are the lungs of the city. It, 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 it strengthens, enhances our in, immunity. And he did all the Central Park. So a lot of lessons to be learned also from the past and bring it to the future. And as who uh, as, uh, uh, said it, that, uh, that uh, never, I think Winston Churchill, never let a good crisis go away. And mm -hmm. you said that everybody's so busy addressing this pandemic. We should have an enterprise 
looking forward, planning ahead for the transformation into the new world order. And the new world order started last March 16, the lockdown. And expect this, there will be COVID-19, COVID-20, COVID-22, all the rest of our lives. So it will be a completely new world. And I hope architecture, design spaces, urban planning will be able to address the futures. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Architect June Palafox. Let's hear the closing statement now from Architect Jello Manyosa. Sir Jello. Yeah, thank you. So um, what, what I basically has been, have been showing you here is kind of what we do and, uh, and how we do it. No? But very few people understand why we do what we do. You know, what, what's, this, what's our sense of purpose? Um, as we start looking at, as, as Tito June says, you look at the, the past designs of our forefathers, um, if you localize it, it's the guys who gave us the Bayo Kubo and then later evolved into the Bayo Nabato. You know, we, we ask ourselves, what's next for the future of Philippine architecture? How do we give continuity to the evolution of a culture as a people? How do we elevate the sense of pride in innovating Philippine design in a post-COVID world? Um, we challenge ourselves with these questions every day with the ideology that architecture must be true to itself, its land and its people. This ideology kind of makes us wake up every day um, to showcase the best of Philippine design to the world. And that's really our, what we consider our sense of purpose. And that's our, our contribution to Philippine architecture. Thank you. Thank you so much, architect Jello Manyosa. Let's hear now from interior designer, Chat Forrest. Ms. Chat? Yeah, with interior design, um, we have to, we really have to adapt to the changes. And such a change is something like this. It's a disruption. And um, economically and everything else, we're all affected. So design has to adapt to these. And on a smaller scale, yeah, let's fix our spaces. We'll fix that. But it all comes to function as well. And one thing we have to think of also for our homes and buildings and interior settings, because mostly our company designs a lot of um, amenities for buildings and residential condominiums and office spaces, like we do the lobbies and all. And one thing that we have considered is we have to start adapting to things that cannot be touched. So we have to adapt to not only COVID, but everything else that may come later on, sensor type, you know, sensor type, bathroom fixtures and fittings, non-porous finishes, um, things that the bacteria can't penetrate, we have to have disinfection areas, even for delivery of grab, uh, messengerial services, packages, couriers, and we can't just put them directly in the mailbox. We have to have a room already for disinfecting these packages and a separate entrance for them. So in, in interior design, you really have to consider function first before anything else. Of course, beauty second, but... Um, we have to consider function and that is one thing that we are adapting to right now. And truthfully, we're still in the learning stage because we haven't really studied the whole, the whole process of the virus. We don't even know what, what exactly causes everything. You know? So once we have the complete, complete study of that under the medical field, then we'll be able to seriously adapt to all these changes. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Chat. And last but not the least, let's have the final words from architect Giorgio Tolentino. Sir Giorgio? Well, uh, as what uh, this pandemic has showed us, uh, digital transformation is important in, in our business. Uh, it's, it's an idea that uh, its time has come. So uh, all of us should face the inevitable and find ways on how we can transform our business uh, digitally. Uh, in the past, uh, you know, digital uh, way of working is just an, was just an option, but now it is the norm, and that's the future of doing business. Uh, I believe that this pandemic uh, also brings opportunities. If we were to be digitally enabled, uh, if you think about it, we can uh, provide our expertise and our service uh, anywhere in the world. We can procure skills and talent uh, you know, not only in the Philippines, but wherever we need to get it. So uh, the important thing is mindset. Uh, change is always difficult, uh, and uh, but change is also important. Uh, we need to develop in each and every one of us a growth mindset that things evolve 
and uh, the practice also has to progress and the tools that we use for the practice has to also be such that it is comparable with what is done globally. So uh, for students, I'm glad that many uh, our, our young people are very digitally enabled. So for them, the transformation is a lot easier. Uh, it's like putting fish in water. Uh, the challenge is for the whole industry to migrate uh, and to to find a way for us to uh, to go to the new normal in doing projects and in uh, running our businesses. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sir Jojo. And that concludes our webinar for today. Uh, thank you to everyone who attended and who are sending their messages of thanks on the chat box. Uh, just a little note, we will our webinar team will choose uh, the best questions uh, to be answered by the speakers, and we will uh, uh, relay the answers through an FB post. So please stay tuned to the Enderon College's Facebook page. Thank you, everyone. Thank you to all our dear speakers uh, for today's webinar, and more importantly, for accepting our invitation to be members of the advisory board of Enderon's College of Architecture and Design. And for all the young ones out there, the students, here you have it. Uh, if you choose to study these disciplines, uh, consider studying at Enderon and you will be learning from the best. And with that, we'd like to thank everyone. And I hope everyone stays safe and God bless and have a great afternoon. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you very much. Thank Bye -bye. you.